Welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and myself delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning from coast to coast to coast in Canada. Now, in each episode, we dissect the decisions and explore the dynamic world of local governance. Today, we bring you the letter Z, which is for zoning. Later in the episode, we'll be chatting with the president of the Association of Development Officers of Alberta. But first, as always, the check-in. Ian, how are you? Good. You uh, you got through Z is for zoning without mentioning it was the last letter of the alphabet. And this is our last in this particular series of shows. So we got to switch it up for next time. And we have some great stories that we want to dive into. And we want to start by talking about the City of Thunder Bay, where the City of Thunder Bay's Council Composition Committee is has heard further public feedback regarding the size and scope of future council sizes. Deputations were heard on March 14th, included... Shane Judd, who asked the committee to eliminate ward councillors and replace it with a system of at-large councillors. Quote, this model will allow for a smaller and more efficient city council that can turn its attention to also making city administration smaller and more efficient, end quote. He went on to say, quote, voters only get to cast a ballot for about half of the people sitting on council. Some councillors are elected with as few as a couple of a thousand votes. Ward councillors have the same decision-making powers as a councillor elected by people from all across the city, end quote. Now, the committee received 659 responses as part of the initial public survey, which included specific themes that emerged from the respondents, including nearly 75% of respondents felt that having 13 councillors around the table was not appropriate and did not provide value or represent the city well. About 53.6% of respondents saw the value in having a ward system in Thunder Bay. 83% of respondents felt that a ward boundary review should be completed, while 61% of respondents felt that $31,552 base salary plus a car allowance is fair composition for work performance by a councillor. A final report from the committee on the composition of the council is slated for completion in advance of the 2026 municipal election. Now, Ian, as this is a show about governance, I want to ask the governance question to start off this line of questions here. Is there a difference in governance between an at-large councillor and a ward-based councillor? Sure. For Chris, just for those who aren't necessarily aware, at-large councillors then would be representing or elected by everybody in the municipality. In this case, Thunder Bay is about 110,000 people. A ward-based councillor would be dividing Thunder Bay up into, say, 12. You've got 12 councillors and a mayor. And then each councillor would represent a portion of Thunder Bay, which is about 8,000, 9,000 people, I suspect. Uh, so two different ways of doing it. Either one is representative, uh, depending on how it's structured. So I don't think there's anything inherently good or bad in the overall from going with ward-based versus at-large. I will say, though, that with a population of 110,000 people, it's difficult for any single member of council to represent a particular constituency, just because there's just so many people out there. So right now, if they are divided into wards, the constituency is somewhat smaller, maybe more homogeneous. There's a guarantee that city councillors will live in different parts of the city, which isn't necessarily the case if we're in an at-large system where everybody conceivably could even be neighbors and then serve on city council. So there are there are a couple of ways to think about it. I will say though, with the 100,000 people seems to be kind of the tipping point between where an at-large system has benefits and where a ward-based system has benefits. So a lot of times it's going the other direction because most small municipalities, towns and villages are elected at large, if not all of them. And then they grow and they grow and they grow and they're still elected at large. They get to this 100,000, 110,000 point and they start to think about uh, divvying it up into wards. The uh, grass is not necessarily always greener on the other side. But in this case, what Thunder Bay appears to be doing, saying, we, A, we have too many councillors. B, we need to do a review of the ward boundaries. And C, should we be switching systems? So there are actually, I think, three concurrent topics of discussion going on. Is it better for uh, 
a subcommittee of council to review this policy rather than council themselves, because there can be some sort of uh, air of favoritism because you don't want to lose the fact that you're elected in the next election. And it's probably easier for some people to get elected at a at large than a ward system and vice versa as well. So is it better to have uh, residents run this committee rather than even the councillors? Or would you recommend yeah. councillors do it? So first of all, a council committee has no authority other than that given by council. So even if the council committee came back to council and said, we recommend we go in direction A, council still has the opportunity to debate it and make a decision. The second question to this part to this was, how do the citizens get involved? And oh, quite a few years ago, we were involved in what's called a, a citizens um, a citizens assembly in the city of Lethbridge, where they were trying to decide whether the city of Lethbridge, about the same population as Thunder Bay, was going to move the other direction from an at-large election to moving to ward based. No, sorry, it wasn't quite that one. It was moving from part-time councillors to full-time councillors. And the interesting thing was they got a demographic, a demographically and geographically representative sample of people who lived in Lethbridge together to make a recommendation to council. So instead of taking the, the place of the committee, it was a group of citizens. So either way, council has to make that final decision. I think it's certainly worthwhile having a look at. And I think involving citizens is a good idea. Involving a council, a committee, I think is a good idea because there is going to be a considerable amount, considerable amount of work to do before it goes right to council for a final decision. So I went to the second story and where it's a little bit sure. closer to home in Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities are voicing their concerns over the lack of educational resources available for elected officials in regional municipal governance. Sherry Jimmy, Reeve of the RM of Matoa, have been 20 has over 20 years of experience in municipal politics. She said that while it can be a rewarding career, it can also be very frustrating. Quote, there's a lot of provincial laws that municipalities must adhere to. There are decision making processes that cannot be made in isolation and must be done at in the larger context of the provincial legislation and policy, end quote. She said it can sometimes be difficult to tell what the true authorities are of a rural council, and there should be more educational opportunities for those in leadership positions. She goes on to say that development only adds to more intense decision-making at the local levels, making baseline training a vital part of leadership. SARM has also gone on to say that it wants the provincial government to assist in developing and promoting programs that directly apply to rural Saskatchewan councils, mentorship, continues, continuous education, and enhancing the experience of municipal government. Ian. Not every day do you see an organization and leaders, mayors, councillors calling for more training should provincial governments and organizations like SUMA, like SARM, like AB Munis, like RMA provide more training for municipal leaders. I'm not sure there's a question in there. It's just a statement about it. I'll take off from there. First of all, this isn't just SARM. Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities. It's not just rural municipalities in general, and it's not just Saskatchewan in general. This is a topic of interest right across the country for all municipal leaders, I think. And we want community people to be representing their communities. Doesn't we don't we're not looking for professional politicians uh, or people who've been there for a very long time to continue in those roles. You can't make an elected official take training. You the best that you can do in a lot of cases is put the requirement for training in a code of conduct or a code of ethics that says you have to represent your community well. And in order to do that, you have to do some professional development. So I think that that's kind of as far, that's as far as we go. The fact the province offers some, I think is great. The provincial associations offer, offer some as well. That's really good. Private organizations like mine offer this kind of training as well. But I think, so the options are out there and the opportunities are out there already. It's just a case of cost and the uh, political will to take advantage of it. Do municipal? Uh, so there's two questions I want to ask here, and I want to I want to start by the with the candidates' perspective a little bit here, if you don't sure. mind. And 
there, there's been an abundance of people getting involved in municipal politics. And I say this respectfully to those who are listening. And uh, as our listeners are more in the municipal realm, I say this with due respect. Um, there are more and more people that I find that are getting into the municipal realm who don't have the understanding of what the municipality even does Prior to getting elected, uh, we we often joke on this show because you wrote a book about it that people often wonder who's driving the grader. Can I go drive the grader? Can I go out and actually plow that road, or can I direct John, who drives the grader, to plow Main Street instead of doing Fourth Avenue as per the policy? Does training not have to happen though prior to being elected, rather than after being elected? Because once you're elected. It is a learning curve in itself, and you mm -hmm. should have been prepared prior to that experience of being elected, shouldn't you have? Yeah, sure. I, so I do agree with you. This, we, again, we can't make people do it because we're looking for <laughs> represent, community representation. However, I mean, we do quite a few orientations for candidates. Uh, somebody will hire us in a municipality and say we want to put on an orient a workshop for anybody who's interested in kicking the tires uh learning how learning what the job is and sometimes it's done individually sometimes it's done regionally the rules are the rules so we talk about principles rather than the, the specific details of any municipality a lot of the time so i think that does give people either a leg up as they decide to run or an understanding that what they thought they were going to get to do they can't do i.e. grade the driver and then they just uh, grade the sorry drive the grader and then they decide to go do something else Th that's great but i think also there's often an inverse relationship between those who need that training and education and those that think they actually need it that sometimes the dunning kruger effect runs strong and sometimes people are just interested in change they just want to see something change and don't really care about what the rest of the job is all about Sometimes training, if you look at it on the other side, once you've been elected, that sometimes training, we mentioned code of ethics or code of codes of conduct before, that sometimes a punishment that comes out of breaking those rules is you've got to take more training. So you, we get a negative connotation towards professional development and training. And for our final story, we're going to head over to Atlantic Canada, particularly to the Maritimes, where paper ballots are making a comeback in this fall's Cape Breton regional municipality elections to provide an option for those who don't want to vote electronically. But one councillor says voting by computer or phone should not be allowed at all because it can't be trusted. Quote, I know I had individuals that knowingly voted in my district that weren't residing in the district, end quote, said Councillor Lauren Green, adding, quote, in fact, they weren't even residing in Cape Breton, end quote. Green represents District 12 in the community, which includes parts of Sydney and all of Whitney Pier, Linegan Road, and communities of South Bar and Victoria Mines. Council recently voted 8-2 to two to go with a hybrid option that includes electronic voting by phone or computer and traditional printed ballots. With the electronic systems, voters are mailed a personal ID via snail mail, postage mail, I should note, and those IDs will be needed and the use of their birth dates to confirm their identity when casting a vote via computer or phone. Ian, now the question, because last time I didn't ask it correctly, the question is, <laughs> does the counselor have a point having have a point here regarding online voting this is another like thunder bay with, with at large versus um word based where you stand depends on where you sit if you have an idea about the way things ought to be you're probably going to fall onto that side of the argument to me you've got the same problems with paper ballots as you do with electronic ballots it's just the technology is different right so security is still paramount we're concerned about it online we're concerned about it in person but people can have their paper ballots bought for bought as well as they can vote, have somebody can vote electronically when they're dead. Fraud is fraud to me. And that's a criminal matter, whether it's digital or not. So CBRM here having this consideration uh, is certainly significant. But I, I don't really know that the security is that much greater for paper ballots. We use electronic vote counters anyway. Any one of those points of connection or points of contact are open to some sort of manipulation. So I... The council has a point, whether I, I agree with it or not, I, I don't really, but I, her point is valid for sure. 
Um, so the reason I asked that, because in the last Ontario election, voters voted electronically. I know this because my mother and father currently reside in Ontario, and they told me how easy it was. They didn't have to go stand in the lineup. They could call and make the ballot. <laughs> they could cast yeah. their ballot via phone. Um, but this is the big but. And this is where I just want to talk a little bit of, uh, more about, because I think there's always security issues when it comes to anything electronically. And trust me, sure. everyone's on online. But there were some reports out of the city of Hamilton that users' information, birth dates, ID numbers, were hacked or obtained by through data leaks. Um, mm -hmm. While things are going to evolve and things are always going to get better, is electronic voting the wave of the future? I think so. I, I just do. The, I often talk about a philosophy of meeting people where they are. And sometimes that's physical and sometimes it's philosophical. But if more and more people are starting to say we will, the the voter turnout will rise if I can vote on my using my phone or like, a, like, like an app on my phone rather than the phone itself, I suspect it's going to go that way. Uh, electronic voting kind of, as I mentioned now, is common now anyway. Uh, we do a lot of things online. Security online is there. We see bank, we trust our online banking. And whether you talk about hacking for information and getting people's personal information, that's theft the same way as stealing uh, the um, the voters list or electoral roll would be would be stealing. Again, it's paper versus digital and there's, there's security on both of them up to a point. And the truly committed likely have a way of dealing with those sorts of things. We saw it, we've seen it in, I mean, US elections too, right? So we we see it in all over the place. It's not just got to do with anything that's happening in Nova Scotia or anywhere else in Canada for that matter. But I do think it's going to come to the point where maybe we don't do paper ballots at all anymore. I can hear the heads exploding on Twitter as you said <laughs> that. We'll be right back. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> That's true. We'll be right back with the president of the Association of Development Officers of Alberta. Welcome to Zed is for Zoning on the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Jordan Ruge, president of the Association of Development Officers of Alberta. Jordan has served on the ADOA executive since 2015, holding a number of positions, including membership chair, education chair, vice president, and now president. He has also served as the ADOA's liaison to the University of Alberta's ALUP Advisory Committee. Beginning in February 2015, Jordan has been employed by Smoky Lake County, Alberta, first as a planning and development officer and currently as the manager of planning and development. In his current position, he is responsible for a variety of tasks regarding planning and development, including, but not limited to, issuance of development permits, subdivisions, bylaw amendments, rezoning, opening houses, road closures, and policy and bylaw drafting. With that, Jordan, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we get into the crux of the interview, I have a simple question, but it's a multifaceted question. Can you provide an overview of what the ADOA does to support development officers in both rural and urban communities in Alberta? Sure, I'd be more than happy to. Um, so the ADOA represents and supports over 300 members, uh, both urban and rural in the province of Alberta. And we do that in a variety of ways. Um, first off, we publish a quarterly newsletter called The Communicator, which, among other things, provides our members with information on recent legislative updates pertaining to the planning and development uh, related matters. Um, we do so via the legal corner where we get a lot of expert advice from a couple of the larger law firms in the province. Uh, the Communicator also features articles from our members that highlight their own experiences, which allows our members to learn directly from other development officers that are working in the field. Uh, in addition to the communicator, we host an annual conference, and this year we're celebrating our 40th anniversary, so we're very excited about that. Uh, and at the annual conference, um, we offer our members uh, a number of presentations from the planning and development uh, industry, as well as other related uh, industries such as surveying, engineering, safety codes, uh, environmental issues, wetlands, um, and it offers our members uh, an opportunity to, to hear presentations on a wide range of topics that are of interest to them and, and the work that they do. 
Uh, we also hold intermittent regional meet and greets amongst our development officers so that they can share their knowledge and experiences with one another. So we we have a sort of a collaborative approach that uh, allows members to to basically share best practices uh, through their own experiences. And we found that that's been very valuable to them as well. We also have a members only forum on our website, uh, which is adoa.net in case anybody wants to check it out. And this forum provides our members uh, a place where they can post their questions and receive answers again directly from their colleagues that are working in the industry. So there's a lot of knowledge sharing that goes on uh, just between our members and amongst our members. And finally, the association has a seat on the advisory panel of the Alberta, or sorry, the Applied Land Use and Planning Certificate Program that's offered through the University of Alberta's Faculty of Extension. And this uh, advisory role enables us to give our members a voice in how that program is delivered and structured and to make suggestions on course content that helps provide our members with the necessary skills and knowledge to tackle the many challenges that face development officers when they're working in the field. I'll jump in here if I can just talk a little bit about because our audience is national. And we're speaking to you, of course, in an Alberta context. I suspect the details of the profession are fairly similar, even if the legislation isn't. How much do you see what you do or what you and your colleagues would do around planning, development, zoning, all those things differing across the country? Is it pretty much the same across the country or different? Yeah, I think uh, it's largely the same. And, and certainly I'm not familiar with um, the other you know, provincial legislative frameworks that would pertain to development officer roles. Um, but, uh, you know, I would I would assume that uh, the role that we do is probably quite similar across the country. Um, I do know that some of our members, uh, particularly in the rural areas, um, while a development officer is is perhaps their main role or at least one of their roles, um, those budget constraints that I was referring to earlier and some of the, the you know, the, the, the resource uh, challenges that they have, the human resource challenges that they have, means that our members are uh, increasingly being asked to take on tasks that fall outside the purview of development officers because uh, at least in Alberta you know the development officer role is is fairly well prescribed within the municipal government act it's very specific about uh, what our role is as an officer um, but many of our members uh, like I say in particular in the rural areas are doing uh, work that would fall under the purview of professional planners or um, you know, maybe some uh, landscape architecture. Um, there's obviously administrative things that they're doing, maybe legislative things that they're doing as well. So I think that our members, and I would I would uh, venture to say that members across the country as well, um, need a diverse uh, skill set in order to be able to to do the work of a development officer in some of the adjacent uh, tasks as well. Sure. What's the pipeline like for the next generation of planning and development people? You were on the advisory board with the uh, University of Alberta uh, for their is that uh, land use planning committee. Um, yeah. So are, do you have people coming up behind you? Do you have enough people coming up behind you to take over these roles once the current generation decides they would rather go spend some time on the beach? I certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know I know that the uh, the uh, ALUP program as well as the master's program through the U of A and the U of C, um, you know, they're, they're always full and they're pumping out new graduates. Um, and I think that, that having people that are coming through those programs that are excited to enter into this field uh, is obviously a positive sign. Um, but like I said, not everyone goes through that formal route and mm -hmm. some, some of us, you know, end up uh, pursuing further educational opportunities as our careers uh, evolve. And we've poached a number of people from other, uh, you know, industries as well that uh, that see what we're doing and, and find that it's fun or interesting. And we're always more than happy to have them. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, yeah, there, there's probably enough turnover. I, I think uh, when I look at our membership, we have some people that are, um, you know, on, on the, the back end of their careers. But we've also got a lot of new faces that I've seen at the conference in the last couple of years. And I'm starting to feel like an old guy at uh, 40 years old now. So <laughs> uh, I, I guess we we are in good hands that we've got people coming up to replace us when when it's time for us to leave. So to pick up on what Ian was talking about a little bit, but going back to sort of the demands of the development officer in Alberta, um, as our listenership is more traditionally mayors, councillors, Reeves, CAOs, administration, what can municipalities do to support development officers to cope with the stress and potential burnout resulting from an overly demanding uh, job that they have? 
Yeah, and, and that's a really good question. And admittedly, this is an area where the ADOA itself lacks any formal support systems or resources to address those types of issues. Um, but most of our members are municipal employees and most would have access to uh, mental health supports and services through their benefit package. Um, but I do think that there's more that uh, that the municipalities and the ADOA could do for, for our members in this regard. Um, I know that I benefit from speaking with other development officers and individuals in the planning industry to hear how they're coping with stress and sharing my thoughts on how I deal with it as well. Um, and to this end, I think there's an opportunity for um, both the ADOA as well as municipalities to sort of provide better communication and, and support around these issues. Um, but unfortunately, I, I think that um, resources are limited th at this time. And, you know, I do personally believe that mental and physical well-being of our members um, and everyone else for that matter needs to be a greater priority, um, you know, as society advances. And I think that um, the last couple of years with uh, transitioning out of the pandemic, I think um, these conversations are starting to happen more often now. I think people are uh, more comfortable speaking about mental health challenges that they're going through. And I think that that's sort of where the beginning of that has to happen is, is people feeling more comfortable being able to bring that up with their colleagues, with their bosses, with the, the folks that they work with at the municipal level. Um, but when it comes to what municipalities can do, um, I think a lot of this would, would be an advocacy role to uh, the provincial and federal governments to you know provide that support to communities and whether it's capital funding for uh, mental health facilities or whether it's uh, operational funding for programs and supports. I think that that's kind of the role that municipalities can play. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging, I think, for some of the rural or small town municipalities to be able to provide that supports. Um, and again, that just goes back to the budget constraints. But I think having those conversations with, uh, with the people that are involved and that have the ability to maybe uh, get us some funding at the municipal level would be a, a good starting point. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to something intrigued me a little while ago. You were talking about the way the social environment has changed over the last little while. You made reference to 15-minute cities, for example. In Alberta, we have something called um, uh, land use bylaws uh, that aren't, I don't think they're everywhere in the country, but it's kind of the, some of those master bylaws. When we ever were engaged with the public on something to do with land or governance, things like the United Nations or the World Economic Forum pop up, you talk about privacy and rights and all the rest of that. And imagine many of your members are dealing with it. And that probably comes a large part when you're interacting with the public. So what do you, has your role as an, as a profession, has your role in around community engagement or public participation changed as the, as the society has evolved and kind of, if so, where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, it has changed and it's changed quite uh, significantly, I think, just in the last couple of years. And it's it's sort of ironic because uh, us in the, the planning and development world, we often lament the fact that nobody ever shows up to these open houses, right? Like if we had this conversation five or 10 years ago, I think that the theme would be how do we get more public engagement? How do we get more people interested in what happens in their in their communities and participating in that process. And now it's almost the opposite where we're seeing some of these people come out with these uh, ideas and these theories about, as you said, the, the World Health Organization or or the WEF or some of these other, what I would say are, are conspiracy theories. Um, and it's it's made our job a lot more difficult. In certain situations, it's put some of our members and uh, some of our colleagues in the planning industry um, at risk, I think. Um, and that's frustrating and it's uh, disappointing. But on the other hand, I think that, you know, we have to treat these people with respect and, and we have to um, allow them to participate in the process and feel as though their voices are being heard and, and not be disdainful of, of uh, the opinions that they might have, because obviously that doesn't solve the problem. And in fact, it probably feeds into the narrative that they've, um, you know, reached where they're saying that, you know, the government is doing this and this and this. And obviously, if we're not receptive to those questions and we're dismissing them out of hand, um, that that's problematic. So it's something that we're struggling with. And, um, you know, again, we're, we're speaking with some of our members. Uh, we just had a board meeting a couple of weeks ago where this issue came up. And uh, as an executive, we're trying to decide on whether or not we uh, do a presentation at our conference, or if this is something that we deal with through our, our communicator newsletter. Um, 
but we're interested in hearing from our members their experiences on how they've been able to handle these situations so that we can use that information and provide our members with a path forward because um, I don't think that these types of ideas are going away and in fact uh, I would venture that they're probably going to be become more and more prevalent in in the engagement process um, so it's it's more about just trying to find a way of of um, being uh, open and transparent in the process and also like I say not dismissing uh, some of these ideas that uh, that we might not agree with but um, trying to give people a voice and then beyond that I think that um, our engagement in public participation is evolving um, because of the new technology advancements that we're seeing um, so when I started this process uh, or, or this uh, this career 10 years ago and I was learning GIS uh, which is geographic information systems it's 3d mapping um, the technology was was great but I mean in 10 years it's it's amazing what we can do with that now. And of course, you've got uh, new 3D mapping and imagery, and you've got AI technology that's coming into the forefront. And I think that that's going to allow development officers and planners to be able to um, produce visualizations that will create better understanding of what development proposals will look like. And um, therefore, you know, the people that are participating in this process will have a, a greater sense of what their community is going to look like in the future. And I think that this has the potential to sort of revolutionize the engagement process. And um, because of that, I think that it'll be important for development officers to obtain the technical skills necessary to fully leverage those emerging technologies. So I have two questions left for you, and then we're going to wrap up here. And I have to ask, because the role of the development officer has probably changed in the nine years that you have been a development officer. What you are dealing with now is not what you were dealing with in 2015. What's the next year's next nine years look like for development officers in Alberta? Do you have a, a crystal ball that is giving you some hope that some of these issues that you're dealing with today are going to be alleviated? Or are we going to be back here in nine years having this exact same conversation around regulatory issues, around public engagement, around policy, around land use bylaw, about 15 minute cities? Yeah, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> But I, I think that we will probably continue to deal with many of these issues um, well into the future. I don't know if it's nine or 10 years out, but certainly I think that the trends in, in planning and development uh, towards more sustainable cities or 15 minute cities, you know, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, and I also don't think that just sort of given the political climate that, uh, that you may read on social media out there, um, I don't think that the um, ideas that people have about government overreach and, and property rights are going anywhere either. So I think that that these, these challenges and these issues are here to stay, and it's gonna be incumbent upon us uh, as either development officers or, or uh, municipal and provincial politicians to try to work to, towards uh, solutions and work collaboratively towards those solutions that address some of those goals. Um, we're also gonna see challenges with respect to the changing in climate. And again, I, I don't care what your opinion is. Maybe you don't believe in climate change, but uh, it's real. It's evidenced in, in the, the drought problems that the southern part of Alberta is going through right now. I'm sure that your listeners from across the country are also experiencing climate-related problems. We had the worst fire season on record last summer. Um, and obviously, climate and land use are, are interconnected in a, in a very important way. And from the, the, the planning and development side of things, we've been... Uh, you know, trying to get uh, uh, higher density, smarter cities, sustainable development, whatever you want to call those things for a number of years. Um, and in, in places like Alberta, where, you know, uh, prime agricultural land is, is at a premium, um, we're, we're increasing the population, the food has to come from somewhere. Um, these, these all are sort of interrelated issues when it comes to development, because um, we've got renewable energy projects that um, you know, are going to be located on on agricultural land. So, how do we ensure that that those projects are 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 done in in a, a sustainable manner and that they're targeted towards lands that are you know not as viable as agricultural land? And I, I I'm not sure if you're aware of the AUC report that came down uh, yesterday. I believe I had a chance to to quickly look through some of that. Sounds like it's not as uh, dire of a, a situation as we were uh, told, maybe in terms of the uh, viable uh, agricultural land being taken up. But again, these things are all part of a, of a larger conversation that uh, we need to continue to have. And so I would say that in addition to some of those challenges that we've talked about already that are currently happening, 
Uh, and I think that will continue in the future. I think we're also going to be dealing with some some new challenges as well as ahead. And again, it'll be incumbent upon our members to diversify their skill sets, to continue to stay educated on uh, new and emerging trends. And I have confidence in our members that we'll be able to do that because we've got a lot of uh, very smart and bright individuals uh, that we uh, count amongst our members. Jordan, uh, I want to thank you so much from both Ian and myself for joining us on the political trenches. I was going to try and make some zoning municipal land use slope bylaw, like our grade is perfectly sloped for our trench and our political trenches, but I thought maybe not. But thank you so much for joining us on this uh, the political trenches and talking about the ADOA, but also some of the issues that your members are facing. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jordan. You're welcome, Chris. You're welcome, and I appreciate the opportunity. So our full interview with Jordan will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick break. Ian, Z is for zoning. 26 letters down, 26 episodes later. We are done. Another great interview with our guest today, Jordan Ruge. I want to make sure I pronounced his name right because mm -hmm. I'm 90% sure I pronounced it wrong in their introduction. How did you think the episode went today? I actually learned a lot. The I deal often deal with CAOs and councils. I don't often deal with development officers. So a lot of the specifics of things that he was talking about, I thought were really quite interesting and in how they intersect with a lot of what other people do. So it, a lot of things happen on the land, under the land, in the land. And to me, without these development officers knowing what the heck they're doing, a lot of us are going to have a lot more difficult time. So this is it. We've officially yep. come to the end of the uh, municipal alphabet. Uh, looking back, starting with A is for amalgamation and now Z is for zoning. Um, we are going to be back in two weeks time. Uh, it's going to look a little bit different. We're not going to continue on with the municipal alphabet, but it might be a different iteration. It might be a different title, but we will be back in two weeks time. Ian, it is always a pleasure to sit down with you in the political trenches and talk about these issues. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the first 26. I can't wait for the next 26. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tolerating me for the last 26. It's been more than that because we did a couple of special episodes in there as well. So, but 26 letters for sure. Maybe we need to change, use the Japanese alphabet next. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's always a pleasure. We'll be back in two weeks time, everyone. Ian, always a pleasure. See you soon.